Let's stand right now as we prepare for the word tonight. Book of Hebrews chapter 9. We've been here for a while. We'll continue to be in this chapter. And, and when we get in uh, to chapters uh, 10 and 11, what might be in tandem with Romans chapters uh, 9 and 10 on Sundays, it's going to be an incredible mount, meltdown, I think, of awesome truth and uh, pretty powerful stuff. For those of you who don't know, we started uh, the book of Romans on Sunday and book of Hebrews all in one weekend when... Uh, we saw everybody flowing into this church during COVID and people claiming to be a Christian, but they, didn't, they couldn't even de describe what they believed in. They couldn't tell you why they were a Christian, that we began to uh, just change it up. And I figured, you know what? There's two books for us just to give straight up, and that would be Romans and Hebrews, the, the high mark. Uh, and so, so many people, we thank God for this, are being discipled, and God is using this. We've had people coming to the church of late due to the war in Israel, where we have had a tremendous Sunday attendance of uh, Jews coming from L.A., coming from uh, other areas, Burbank and all, seeking truth. They've been coming, and I've been getting responses from them. They're reading uh, the scriptures, some of them for the first time in their lives, diving into the New Testament. And so this is awesome. And so how appropriate, the book of Hebrews right now, Hebrews chapter 9, I'll begin in verse 1, if you guys pick it up, uh, reading the even-numbered verses, then indeed, even the first covenant, that's the Old Testament, had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, of these things we cannot speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins or the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Listen to this. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerning only with foods and drinks, various washings, imposed until the time of reformation. Well, Father, we pray tonight that you would continue that reformation in our lives, each and every one of us. We know, Lord God, that that first commitment that we made, maybe all of us, some of us in this room, some watching, maybe all, I don't know. We made one commitment at one point in time to say yes to Jesus. Yes to the forgiveness of sins. Yes, he's Lord and Savior. Yes, Christ, come into our lives. And yes, I believe that he died on the cross for me. That's what we prayed. And that he rose again from the dead. That's what we proclaimed. But from this profession, we have walked with you, Lord, in sanctification. You've been molding and shaping us into the image of your son. And Father, we thank you that you will not stop doing that until we meet you in glory. So, Father, we just commit our time to you now. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Church, you may be seated. And now, as we get into this study, yet again, we're looking at a message titled, How Can You Know If You're Right? If you interview the religionists of the world today, no matter where they're from, they're going to believe, they're going to say that they're right. A lot of skeptics will say, a lot of those who will uh, be maybe doubters or atheists will say, uh, you know, every religion thinks that they're right. Well, I, I assume that's true. That's why those 
in those particular religions believe that they are right. But to believe that you're right and to know that you're right is two different things. To believe that you're right based on traditions and, well, this was my father's faith or this is my, my grandfather's faith in whatever it is, that's one thing. But to be able to know that you have experienced God on a personal level, that is something altogether different. And I'm not talking about some uh, supernatural manifestation because, church, those things can be deceptive. They can be dangerous. There are cults who believe that if you wait and that if you uh, just dedicate yourself enough, you'll feel a tingling in your body. You'll feel a manifestation of God's presence. And then you are in or on the team. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the absolute experience of knowing what it's like to have God reveal his holiness to you so that you are absolutely convinced that you need him as Lord and Savior. That your, your arms, as it were, go up, your knees go down, and you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And when that goes about happening, the Lord lays us open, so to speak, and then he, begun, he begins to go to work. And it is personal. And it is so true that we're not right because we think we are. We are right because we know who we're following. Paul put it this way, I have been persuaded by him. I've committed my life to him. And when that's true in your life, friends, listen, we need this now more than ever. When you know that your salvation is secure in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within you and you're a believer in the Lord where it's not some step of feeling, but it's a real step of faith where it is something that you know, God's Holy Spirit has confirmed this to you, and you're a follower of Christ. It's extremely important, and we revel in that. And so, church, as we look at this tonight, we're just going to dive in, remembering this, that chapters 8 and 9 are really something that is welded together, and I'm not going to belabor our previous studies, only to have you go back and look. So tonight, we pick it up in verses 9, and we'll go as far as we can tonight, or chapter 9, beginning at verse 1, where we've spent some time, but mark this down. To know the way, number five is the argument now, to know the way or the map that has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Everything that we've heard about is the author of the book of Hebrews speaking about things of the Old Testament economy. This is vitally important, that the Old Testament is studied and that it is known. And the author of the book of Hebrews knows and expects those who read this epistle, which, by the way, was written in 68 AD. You ought to write that down in your notes. Because when he authored this, the temple was still standing. I find that fascinating. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then indeed, even the first covenant, and in your notes by now, if you've been here, that's the Old Testament, had ordinances. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is how you approach God. These things are called divine service or services. And the earthly sanctuary, verse 2 says, for a tabernacle was prepared. Now, in this sense, the author is speaking about the tabernacle in the wilderness. This predates the first temple. He's talking about the setup that was in the wilderness once they left Egypt. In that first covenant, having these ordinances, please write this down, were all types and symbols. You want to think about this right now. As believers today, somebody might say to us, what right do you guys have, for example, to even be reading the book of Hebrews for crying out loud? It's called the book of Hebrews. You guys are a bunch of Gentiles. What are you reading this for? Well, number one is the fact that it's a New Testament book written by someone, I think it was Paul personally, who knew everything about Judaism and the, the experience of the nation. Whoever wrote it was extremely intellectual on all of the things that make up part of the Judaism of his day, but he begins to break down the fact that if you're trying to approach God in your acts of Judaism, that's nothing but traditions. And if you look to say, well, wait a minute, we're doing these things exactly as Moses 
prescribed. This author, who's definitely a Jew, is speaking to the Hebrew believers who came out of Judaism and they're following Yeshua, Jesus, as Messiah. And he's teaching them that all of the stuff of the old economy was fulfilled. This is why Bible prophecy is so important. That God makes his announcement. And he says it's the first covenant. You can't have the first covenant unless it speaks of a second or the last. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. By the way, because of current events, I want to stress, we're looking at a 2,800-year-old prophecy, the house of Israel. It's not the house of Palestine. It's not the house of California. It's the house of Israel, for crying out loud. It's very clear in the Bible. Somebody, a lot of people today are talking about how Israel's just over 70 years of age. That's ridiculous. Israel 2.0 is just over 70 years of age, but Israel's been around for over 3,000 years. And we need to remember that. Sorry, I've been, I was rabbit trailing there for a moment. To the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's not only speaking to the nation of Israel, it is speaking to all those who understand that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Again, Ezekiel 36 verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of Uh, your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my, I love this. I will put my spirit within you. Listen, and cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. I love that. You don't do it. God does it through you and in you. I will put my spirit in you. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come and he'll dwell in you. John chapter three, verse 12. John three, 12 says, If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Listen. And as Moses was lifted up or lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I want you to hang on to this because it's all preparatory to where we're going. Proverbs 30 verse 4, you guys know this very well. Who has ascended into heaven? Or descended. That sounds like verse 13 of John. That's John 3.13. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Proverbs 30 verse 4 says. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? And who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you know. Absolutely powerful. Notice I'm making my case from the Old Testament. In the tabernacle, wilderness wanderings, everything spoke regarding the Messiah to come. And when the temple was built under Solomon, everything spoke about the Messiah to come. All of it were types and symbols from the showbread to the offering to the holy place to the holy of holies. All of it spoke about the coming of Christ. Psalms chapter 2 verse 1. Why do the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. Sounds like the LA Times, front page. (laughs) The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. That is that they're united against the Lord and against his anointed. Listen, you and I may not appreciate the word anointed, but if you're Jewish, that's the Messiah. You can't get away from it. It is the Messiah. Every Jew knows this. He's speaking about the Messiah. Saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4 is awesome. 
He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And it almost seems like there's a breath, there's a pause. And verse 6 descends upon us. Yet I have set my king. This is God speaking. God says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. This is a dialogue between God the Father and God the Son. And listen, tonight you can't say, well, we don't believe in God the Son. You have to believe in God the Son. We just read the Old Testament scriptures. You say, well, my tradition didn't teach me that. That's right, it didn't. Are you a Muslim tonight? What are you going to do about your sins? I mentioned just uh, the other day, somewhere, was it here? I was speaking somewhere. We're all around the Dome of the Rock Mosque in Jerusalem tonight, the Dome of the Rock Mosque. You know the, the dome that looks gold? It says all around it in Arabic, God does not have a son. All around it, all the way around, 360 degrees. Why does it say that? Why do those traditional rabbis teach today, God doesn't have a son, he can't have a son, when the Old Testament scriptures proclaim that God has a son? It's absolutely amazing because all of us here tonight that have faith in Christ and we trust God, our faith is founded upon fact, which is a refreshing truth. We can argue what it is that we believe. You see, we don't believe in this and thus it is right. Because it's right and correct, we believe in it. We don't have anyone, listen, we don't have anyone to defend and we don't have to defend our God. He is alive, he's real, and he's very much able to protect himself and defend himself. We do the best we can to argue good doctrinally, we give a good witness, you know, about the truth of God, but the bottom line is, if we all fail, he's yet true. He never fails. But I love the fact that throughout scripture, the fact of the matter is, you and I know the way. God has given us that map, and we can know that we're right. Because we're following God. It's his truth that we're leaning upon. Way back when, Hebrews chapter 1, we studied that a long time ago. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the world's. What an awesome truth that is. And so God has shown us the way. When you think about the the temple and all of the furniture, we'll call it that way, the, the way it's laid out, all of it speaks about Christ. And um never really thought about it much before, but you know, when you walk into this main sanctuary through the front doors, you come into that foyer area and I love the fact that there's a 2,000 pound uncut Jerusalem stone there that was donated to us by friends in Israel and then there's a seven lampstand menorah coming out of that great stone that was uh, made in 1954 by uh, Eli Barkan he's the guy that made the exact same one for the Knesset today that's in Israel And he made some prototypes, and that's one of them right there. That's a museum piece that's in that foyer right there. But if you could imagine walking in to the tabernacle or the temple, when you walk into this place tonight, you walk through that stone, and you walk past that seven lampstand menorah, but then you come into the sanctuary. Even this is a type, isn't it? This is not the reality. We are are heading toward reality, church. We're heading toward it. This life that we're living, oh, don't don't get me wrong. It matters. It matters. But uh, this ain't it. Everybody's watching their retirement evaporate right now in Wall Street. Market was pathetic today. And I had to turn off my alerts on my phone. I'm trying to study the Bible. And I had to just turn off my mammon, my mammon indicator. (laughs) 
this is crashing, that's crashing. It's like, oh, forget it, let it all go. It's all gonna burn, folks. But listen, when you and I enter eternity, all of this is gonna matter. And how you view Jesus Christ matters. Is he the son of God or not? Is he the Lord? Is he the Savior? Is he the one who died on the cross and rose again from the grave? Is he exactly the one who the Bible said he would be? And then the New Testament records that he is. Absolutely remarkable. Number six in our study. How can you and I know if we're right? Is verses two to five, and it's this. By what was said of the future. The first part in which the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. All of these things are types, as we were mentioning earlier. And he begins to describe or make mention of these things that to the Jewish mind are very dear, very precious. But my dear friends, I want you to know that the lampstand is a lampstand that God told Moses to have artisans craft based upon what God showed Moses of the actual which is in heaven. The table, the showbread, the sanctuary, all of it is a type, is a symbol of what reality is in eternity. By the way, I was doing some reading in preparation for this, and it was amazing to find out that when in the wilderness Israel was traveling, do you remember the Bible tells us that when the glory of God would move, Israel, listen, this is so cool, Israel was supposed to keep their eye on the cloud, the cloud and the pillar of fire. And when God moved, that would move. And when God would stand still, it would stand still. And when he would stand still, they would set up their tents. They would, they would break up by tribe and they would gather. To, can you imagine two million campers? <laughs> two million people camping. I missed you last Wednesday night. We were camping in Yosemite. Well, not really. You know what glamping is? First time we've ever went glamping. It was kind of rough because there's no room service with glamping. But you rent this Airstream trailer that's already parked and it's all ready for you and you walk in there and it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Very comfortable and all that stuff. I don't know how the children of Israel had it, but I know this. We had to go to the lodge to get breakfast in the morning. All they had to do was stick their hand outside their tent and there was manna right there in the morning for them to scoop up. And they would look out the window and they'd see the presence of God. And he was so merciful to them that he didn't seem to move in the middle of the night when their babies were sleeping and they were all tucked in bed. He was so kind and merciful to move when they were watching. When they looked, they saw that he was moving and they would break up camp and they would follow God. And the Bible says sometimes it would be Days, sometimes it would be longer, sometimes it would be short, but they would follow him. Isn't that indicative of the Christian life today? That we're to be following him, we've got to keep our eyes on him? Because God could move at any moment in our lives? Are you looking for God to move in your life? That's the hope that keeps me going. Listen, I should, be, listen, I should go back with Pastor Joey to Kauai and put my feet up in a hammock. I'm old enough. I don't want to do that. I don't even think we'll do that in heaven. I think we'll have a blast in heaven. Who I mean, just going to lay in a hammock in heaven? Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's going to be pretty amazing. But in our flesh, we could say, oh, I've earned a break. Listen, when God says, let's get up and move. Listen, even if you are hardly able to take a step, God will give you the strength to do it. He'll, he'll do a Caleb to you, you know? He'll give you the strength to take that mountain. Listen, unless you are departing uh, for heaven tonight, uh, God's got a plan to use you. And we must never underestimate the power of God to want to go to work in our lives. Nor is timing. A lot of people today are thinking, well, I, I, what am I going to do? I can't, I'm too young. Have you noticed that every time we've got an excuse that's not acceptable to God? I'm too young. I'm too middle-aged, I'm too old, I'm too poor, I'm too rich, I don't have enough time, I've got too much time. God, I think God sometimes puts his fingers in his ears, and he just, he just will not listen to it. But listen, we're to be looking to him to see where he's moving, where he's going. Is he standing still? He'll be doing a work in our lives. Is he leading us on? He'll be doing a work in our lives. John chapter 6, verse 30. 
what was said about the future. I'm reminded here in John chapter 6, verse 30. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see and believe you? What work will you do? They wanted Jesus to do another trick. They wanted him to do a miracle. Come on, Jesus, one more. Do something for us and we'll believe. Listen, uh, don't ever fall for that kind of junk. I think it's Vance Havner that said, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. I like that. When you see stuff happen, even if it's a miracle, you don't know where it came from. Let's be honest. I hope you know about that, church. There's a day coming, according to the Bible. Jesus said there's going to be days coming where there's going to be profound miracles done by great deceivers. I believe they're on earth right now. I believe they're happening. In parts of the world. I, this is my opinion. If the church loses its light, whatever light it has left in America, if the church if, extinguishes its own light by self, that's a self-inflicted wound, by the way. God wants the church to burn bright in America and in the world for that matter. Amen. But instead of dialing down on the word of God, we're embracing silly, dumb things. And I got to tell you, these last few weeks with Israel at war and the things that have been uh, posted in the world by, watch my fingers, pastors. I got to tell you, I've been, I've been a Christian a long time. God's done a big work in my life. I grew up in a Marine Corps home in San Diego. One of the things I learned real quick was how to defend yourself. <laughs> and uh, I lived in that Marine Corps home 19 years before I married Lisa. God brought her into my life to rescue me. <laughs> but I got to tell you, when I, when I hear somebody declare that they're a pastor and then attack Israel as they are right now in this, in this nation and their understanding of the Bible to say that the church has replaced Israel and Israel, it can just be gone away, just boils my blood it just infuriates me. And then the Lord calms me down and uh, reminds me, Jack, not all those who are, of, are within the church are of the church. <laughs> and they'll say things like, well, you know, Israel forfeited its covenant, its promises. Well, it's too bad the author of the book of Hebrews didn't know that. And I've told you before, and I'll say it again. If God does not keep his promises to Israel, none of us have the assurance of eternal life. God will keep his promises to Israel. And you watch, by the way, you scoffers and mockers about the existence of Israel. Just wait, because we're already starting to experience what God is doing through this horrible war here in Southern California. So many Jews are coming to church. What's going on? God is waking up his people. The veil is lifting. And then there'll be some pharisaical nincompoop and say something like, well, that's, that's just a coincidence. That's not really happening to them. They're cursed. They're banished by God. Wow, really? What sign will you perform then that we may believe in you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the man in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, I wonder what was on Jesus' face when he said, what kind of look did he have? Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us bread, this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He's the manna. The manna that was there every day was a type of symbol. God presented himself. Verses three through five tells us, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant or the Ten Commandments. 
Verse 5, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. He says here, of things, of these things which we cannot speak in detail. It does, that's a great statement. He's not saying, I don't have the answer, so I can't talk about the detail. The guy, whoever he is, again, I think it's Paul, but there's a reason why the authorship is not announced. It doesn't matter. Whoever is speaking to these born-again Jews who've come to understand that the Old Testament speaks about Christ as the Messiah, he says to them, I don't need to tell you about the stuff you already know. We don't need to get into the details because what's implied in the statement is you already know them. You guys already know all this stuff. All of these things are types and symbols. They mean so much, yes. But listen, church, just to sum it up, there were two cherubim that overshadowed or presided over the mercy seat. That's the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Just listen, just the fact that there were two angels tells you that this whole thing, as the Bible says, is symbolic. All of those things spoke about what's really in heaven. Are angels made out of gold? No. Does the blood of an animal presented on the mercy seat really forgive your sins? No, the Bible says it covered over until that which is perfect would come. Was the showbread really the bread of life? Or was it speaking about the bread of life that would come? It was all prophetic. It was speaking about the future. And you and I live in an amazing time to take the word of God and when it says these were types and symbols, then it means exactly that. But when the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, friends, that's, no, that's not poetic. That's real. He did it. When the Bible gives an account of his people, it's for real. Well, you know, David killing Goliath, it's a metaphor. No, it's not. No, David really killed Goliath, and I would love to see Spielberg do a rendering of that. <laughs> or when the Bible says to the Assyrian army, that death angel passed through one night in, in, in its defense of Israel, and they killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. One angel went through their camp and took the breath away of 185,000 soldiers. Well, that's symbolic. No, it's not. But when the Bible says these are types and symbols, then it's exactly what it is. And we have to stop and ask the question, what is it speaking of? And I'll say to you tonight, the future. And remember now, what was in the Old Testament pointed to the future. And you and I in the New Testament, and not only does the New Testament point to the future, but it also gives us the, the record of the fulfillment of what was prophesied in so many cases. But the mercy seat is the chief location in all of this model building, if I can put it that way, with reverence. It would be, it would be so wrong, people, you know this, right? If we lived back then, it would be so wrong for you to bow down and worship the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know that that would offend God? The glory of God was allowed to be manifested over the mercy seat. But you didn't bow down and worship the angels that were graven in, out of gold. That would have been a sin. Why? Because God is a reality. God is real and he's a person. Your personality that you possess, you bear the image of God, even in your personality. Isn't that amazing? It is true. God's not a human, but he became a human to die for us on the cross. God the Son. And this whole setup is the doctrine of, a, of the atonement, actually. I want to read something to you. The doctrine is this, to make atonement or reconciliation, to pay an unpaid debt by the act of propitiation for another. It requires both the participation of the guilty receiving the purchased forgiveness and the innocent being offered up or paying the debt on behalf of the guilty, thereby meaning the terms of reconciliation. It was a willful act by the offended, that would be God, to the appeasement or satisfaction of the offended, specifically toward God. 
Propitiation is a two-part act that involves appeasing the wrath of an offended person, in this case God, and being reconciled to God by the offering of his innocence. Big word, propitiation, we're going to read about it in a moment, simply means that God provided the way of your salvation. He paid a debt you could never pay. None of us could afford it. It is the ultimate gift. That's John 3.16, summed up in one word, propitiation. Mark it down in the Hebrew language. It means this, to pacify, to appease, atone for, to cancel out or to take away. Propitiation. It makes sense, more sense in a moment. In Greek, it's this, to provide an act of mercy whereby the crimes of the guilty are punished, yet the guilty is acquitted and declared legally sinless. Thus the law and justice are preserved. How does a holy God who is sinned against deal with that sin because he's just and at the same time because he loves you, how does he provide for you salvation? You think that through for a moment. He's holy. He cannot let injustice slide. Friends, no injustice no one just, have, you, look at the, you look at your life, my life, life, and you see the injustices that have gone on in this world. Don't think that they're not going to be dealt with. Well, the court let the guy off. He's walking free today. He, excuse me. He's walking free today. Please don't lose, lose sight of the fact that the eternal God will judge all unrighteousness in the end. But to those who turn to him in faith, God has provided the propitiation, the offering of Christ his son, fulfilling all of this Old Testament picture that Jesus is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. God is the one who has sinned against, but he turns right around, maintains his own justice because he's going to punish sin. He has to. But he loves you. And so what he does is he offers himself as the sacrifice to receive the punishment, maintaining his own justice, while at the same time providing a a sacrifice that is approved by him. And the burden is upon you to accept that offering. He paid such a great price. People have argued the fact, is hell really forever? The Bible says it's forever. Well, that seems unjust. To you it does because you do not know the purity and the holiness of God. When we think about, well, I don't think it's right that hell, uh, you know, is forever. It's just, it's simply because we cannot, cannot even fathom the righteousness of God and the innocence of Christ. Hell is forever. I'm not interested in that though. I'm going to heaven. That's all I care about. That, that, that is going to be a great forever. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. You guys okay? Yeah. Romans three twenty three says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by His blood, the Son. Remember I told you in the introduction, pay attention to the Son, God's Son, his son, his name, the name of his son, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you, do, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Isn't that great? We have an attorney. We have someone in Christ Jesus who argues our case before the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. You see, that's, listen, Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. People are going to argue that. There's some from various groups that follow various teachings of men, and they say, no, 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 the sacrifice of Christ was limited to only those who believe. I don't know where you get that from. Watch, listen, Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. But only those who receive Christ benefit from that price he paid. Watch this. It's a great blessing. It's also a great cursing. 
Because he died for the sins of the world, the only way that you'd wind up in hell is if that you reject that offering he did regarding your sin. Listen, the sin that is going to cast you down into hell is not being out behind the 7-Eleven with Barbie. That's not, that's not the sin. It's, it's, not, it's not you smooching with Rocky that's going to throw you into hell. That's not it. It's not you robbing a bank. It's not murder. That's not going to throw you into hell. He died for the sins of the world. There's one sin that will cast you straight into hell. It's the unforgivable sin. Did you know that? The Bible singles it out. It's the unforgivable sin. It will not be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. And that is the sin against the Holy Spirit. So why is that such a big deal? Because for 2,000 years, it's been the Holy Spirit's job to preach the gospel of Christ through us, through people. And Jesus said, if you sin against the Father or if you sin against the Son, it will be forgiven you. But if you sin against the Holy Spirit, it will never be forgiven you. And that is to die in this world by rejecting the offering of the free gift that he paid everything for to get you to heaven. You see, if somebody's in hell right now, it's because they didn't accept the fact that God paid for all of their sins and they wouldn't accept that offer of forgiveness. That's huge. And by the way, that is a justifiable hell. They threw off the gift. They didn't want it. And that's where they're at. You think about that. People who inherit hell, they want to be there in a sense. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, you ask them, do you, want to, do you want to follow Christ? No. Nope. Have you heard the gospel? Yes. Do you believe it? No. Do you even want to believe it? No. Have you ever seen like the Christian reporter on the street ask people, if God was real and heaven was real, would you want to go? No. They wouldn't be happy in heaven. They'd be walking around kicking a can, all bummed out. There's no partying and drinking and... Whatever you do, country western music. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I heard a song, it's in my head, and I'm trying to pray it out. But church, people think, well, I had a guy tell me on Newport Beach Pier, I want to go to hell because I want to be there with my friends. I told him, I said, you got, man, you got a shot coming. Your friends, listen, your friends might be there, maybe not, I don't know. But you're not going to be hanging out with your buddies in hell. You're not going to be like cooking marshmallows with Satan over a fire. That ain't going to happen. When you combine all of the characteristics of hell, it's forever dark, pitch black. There's a feeling that you're being eaten by worms, that you're burning, but you're never consumed. It hurts so bad that you gnash, the word is break your teeth, grinding from pain. And that you're tormented. There's no evidence that you're hanging out with anybody else in hell. You don't want to go there, friends. The Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. That is, his fallen angels. And God did everything to get you into heaven. What an awesome God. Colossians, oh Lord, stop the clock, please. (laughs) Colossians 2.11 says there, in him, that's Christ Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through the faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, watch this, verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. In other words, everything Jesus did on the cross, he did for you and I in in taking away our sins. He paid the price there. And then listen, finally this, how you and I can know if we're right, it's because we know And we now know it's by God and him alone. Verses 6 through 10. Now when these things had been thus prepared, speaking about the tabernacle, 
The priest always went in to the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. This happened every day. But into the second part, the high priest went only once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Imagine that. So the priests that were doing the daily administration of the ordinances and the ministry of the people before God would be, so to speak, in the foyer. But the high priest, once a year in the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, he would walk through those wooden doors into this room where God would dwell. Once a year. And he had to have blood for himself because he's a sinner. He had to have blood for his family because they're sinners. And he had to have blood for the nation because he was the high priest. Isn't it awesome? Again, this is in 68 AD. Why do I point that out? Because in 70 AD, two years from the giving of this book, the temple will be destroyed in Jerusalem. And if your salvation is linked to an earthly practice and that temple goes down, you're done. If your salvation is connected to your denominational membership, you're in trouble. Think about it. Our Catholic friends, listen, that, the Catholic Church didn't die for you. Jesus died for you. And there's not going to be churches in heaven. The church is going to be in heaven. And I think we're going to be shocked, by the way. Who's there? I think God's grace is going to blow our minds. There's probably going to be people there we thought would never make it. And then there's going to be, we're going to be looking around, hey, where's so-and-so? For sure he's here. Oh, uh, I don't know. I haven't seen him. I've been up here for 10,000 years. I haven't seen him yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not going to be good. <laughs> Man. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. Just, uh, we'll put this, we'll put this down here just now. Then Jesus went out, verse 1 of the, departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple and Jesus said to them now think of the book of Hebrews Jesus said to them do you not see all these things assuredly I say to you not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down and that's exactly what happened in 70 AD And those who understood the Old Testament promises and the Old Testament depic depictions and realities, of course, knew in that moment, when that temple went down, Christ resided in their hearts. That the old was coming to a conclusion, if not, had already died out, and God had replaced it. I want to show you something really quick, just because it's cool, and for skeptics, they, they should know this stuff. Um, I don't know if you've been to the Forum in Rome. It's, it's, it's incredible. But this is the Arch of Titus. This is where, uh, typifying the victory of many Roman victories, but this is dedicated to General Titus uh, Vespasian. But... Zoom in on it, you guys. We have another clip. You see some of these reliefs that are there? That's one side, by the way. That is a, that is a Roman army coming into Rome, into, uh, down through that arch, and the, the, the population of Rome's going crazy with celebration. And, and behind the general would be all of the loot the booty, the reward, the, cap, the things taken captive, including people taken captive and brought back to Rome. Note what's on the other side of that. Next slide. Is this depiction. This is in Rome. You can fly to Rome tonight and see it for yourself. So don't believe this stuff. Well, okay, you should have told these guys a long time ago not, not to do this. Now, why is that there? That's the seven lampstand menorah. Why is it there? Let's show you the next picture. This is the Jews 
and Romans bringing into Rome the articles of the temple from 70 AD. Can I remind you we're talking about the Bible tonight? If you're not a believer, what in the world are you doing? Even Rome, as a secular testimony of the menorah, the lampstand you read about in the Bible here. Jesus said, and now one stone will be left upon another. That's exactly, I was going to bore you tonight and read you the war, a page from the war of, of Josephus. And it was, it's amazing because the, eye, the eyewitness of the destruction and how they scraped the gold off the stones and not one stone was left upon another in 70 AD. You know, listen, it is believed, and the Pope alluded to it two weeks ago, it is believed that that menorah, among many other artifacts, are in the vault in Rome at the Vatican today. The Pope recently said that they believe it's time to give back to Jerusalem articles from the temple of 2,000 years ago. That should get your attention. Church, I've got a lot, but we're out of time. Listen, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's make sure that you understand, because next week we've got to get into verse 11. So you're going to have to read verses 9. No, I have to read 9 through 10. I just have to read it. I won't talk about it. I promise. I won't talk about it. <laughs> verse 9. It was, what? Symbolic. Symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him the priest who offered the service perfect regarding to the conscience, concerned with only or only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed, yeah, I love this, until the time of reformation. You think drinking this or not drinking that's going to get you entrance into heaven? What about food? Well, we don't eat this. We, we, uh, we, no. No. It all spoke about what was coming. And so I want to leave you with this. Church, tonight, maybe you're watching right now somewhere. Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Messiah? Have you ever wondered with all of the religion and all of the tradition, you're still empty and lonely inside of you? Isn't it amazing? I think it's horrible that I get to walk around this world and I'm never alone. He's always with me and I know it. Why would you settle for anything less? Well, I was baptized as a, as a kid. So what? Well, I had confirmation. My dad used to be a pastor. That's probably a, a, a mark against you. You probably... My grandmother sang in the choir, all that stuff. You know, listen, seriously. Tonight, the absolute urgent yet simple thing to do is to ask you right now tonight, have you ever received Christ into your life? Have you invited the Messiah of the world into your life? Because, friends, don't trust in externals. Don't, don't trust in, in rituals. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head and pray, and maybe you're watching right now, and you're somewhere, maybe you're in a small group, one of our many small groups that are throughout the land and beyond, maybe you're listening by now by radio, who knows, it doesn't matter wherever you're at, I want to ask you to just pray, maybe you can't stop, maybe you can't pull over, but God is speaking to you tonight, and I want to invite you to call upon the real priest, the one and only. The one who's not only the priest, he's the sacrifice. He's not only the priest and the sacrifice, he's the atonement for you. And he's the resurrected one to make sure it all is applied properly. <laughs> he not only gave it, he ensures it. And tonight you would say yes to Jesus. Father, we come to you tonight and we say, Lord, blessed be the name of the glory of your kingdom forever and ever. We pray, Father God, that tonight you would speak to hearts and cause us to be quickened to the very soul 
of who we are, that we might re rejoice in the simplicity of the gospel. We read it in the beginning of tonight's study, that it's all about Jesus, it's all about the Son of God, that God has a son, and his name is Yeshua, his name is Jesus. And it's that name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. That your Bible tells us it's now appointed unto every man once to die, and then comes the judgment. But Jesus said, if you believe in me now, you pass from judgment to life. What a great escape. Oh, Lord, wash us. Apply the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus. We're not interested in animals and bulls and sacrifices in any temple or any spot on this earth. You're the living God. You're the personal God. You're the sacrificial God. You're the giving God. You're the loving God. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight, I'm not going to make this a big deal. If God is speaking to your heart, you simply tell him in your own words, Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. I ask you to wash me clean. I ask you to put your spirit in my life to cause me to be, as Jesus said, born anew, born from heaven, born again. And God, that I would commit my life to you tonight and follow you. I, I want to just hand you the reins, the steering wheel, Lord, as it were, of my life and ask you to take control. No, friend, you don't need to insert anything into that. It's not your morality, it's not your works, it's not your deeds, it's not your denomination, it's not your religion. It's you divorcing yourself from all those externals and coming to Christ. And Christ, Jesus, brings you to the Father. No man can come to the Father but through me, Jesus said. So, Father, for these who are saying yes to you, you know that, you see that, Father, you hear their heart, you hear their mind. I pray, Father God, that your spirit would come.